or saw the announcement in Canvas, but there is a tremendous opportunity for students of Snow College during our spring break. So raise your hand if you've already heard about the Disney opportunity. Okay, half of you have. A week from today, there's an informational meeting that I would encourage you to attend. It doesn't obligate you to anything, but it gives you an opportunity to at least learn about the spring break Walt Disney World um, trip. In Florida, students who participate in this program will be able to earn credit while getting a behind the scenes tour and some leadership training from Disney, as well as a whole bunch of fun at Disney World and theme parks. So uh, if you'd like to learn more about that, write this down September 29th in the business building in room 104. And that'll be at five o'clock. So you'll want to come at five o'clock in the, in the evening Next Tuesday, I think it'll be a short meeting. They'll give you some information and answer questions that you may have. We'd like to welcome all of our guests today. I see several of our community members, business owners, or some faculty. We have President Carlson with us today. Thank you for being here. And our most uh, important guests are Phil and Shirley Rowley. You raise your hand, Shirley, because I know Phil's going to stand up here. We don't want you to sneak by without being recognized. It's my privilege to introduce them. The Rollins family comes from a tradition started, from what I understand, in about 1913 of fruit growing. And they carried that forward as Phil and Shirley started their own farm, Rollins Southridge Farms, in 1984. They have eight sons, and as president of the company, Phil and his wife Shirley have led that company through various innovations and a lot of changes. And uh, about halfway from the time they started to today, they started something else that was in September of 1999. So we're almost on an anniversary, or probably just past an anniversary mark, for the Red Barn in Santa Quinn. Many of you have seen that off of the freeways you've dri driven down I-15. The Red Barn is home to fresh fruit, a line of country spoon products, old-fashioned ice cream parlor, and so forth. And the mission of the Red Barn is to offer customers the opportunity to have an on-the-farm experience where you can pick your own fruit, uh, tour the farm, and provide fresh, local fruit, quality food products, and homemade ice cream. A couple of years ago, they also opened another uh, similar program, similar outlet in southern Utah called the Dixie Outlet. There you can get the same great products and opportunities that you have at the Red Barn. Uh, in Santa Cruz. So with that, I'd like you to join me in welcoming Phil Rowley. Well, I'm glad to be here today. <clears throat> I would encourage you to sign up for that Disney World. I, that's intriguing. I think I might like to sign up for that as well. Well, they need a chapter on or two. Yeah, the other, the other day we were watching a, uh, our television, it was uh, telling about how Walt Disney started, and that really intrigued us, and so we uh, thought about, a little bit about that, talked a little bit about it, so if you get a chance, I think that would be a great thing to do. He was certainly a great entrepreneur. Uh, on our farm, I want to introduce our farm, who we are a little bit, but a few uh, months ago, there's a, there's a spot on our farm where we have been finding uh, arrowheads. And three or four months ago, we found this, which I have come to really treasure because this particular arrowhead is made out of sugar stone, which is a little bit before uh, some of the other arrowheads that they made out of the uh, materials that are so hard. So. It shows you, it's a, run, it's a reminder to me that we are just stewards of the land that we walk on. I mean, someone else walked on our farm long before it was our farm, and they considered it their area. And even made arrowheads and, and things like that to make a, make a living there for themselves. Anyway, my name is Phil Rowley. And 
I am a fourth generation. Well, I guess I'm the third generation. My sons are the fourth generation. So you might say, how many? How, how did you get so many generations in the time between 1984 and now? Uh, my father and my brother and I began farming together uh, a long time ago. And he had eight children and I had eight children. And it got to be time to divide the, the area up so that we could have more opportunities for our sons to thrive and to grow in the fruit growing business. And so that's how we started in 1984 as a, as a fruit farm in Santa Clara. I grew up actually in Warren, Utah, where uh, there was a fruit farm there. And we grew up uh, there growing fruit. And finally, when I was about 11, then my father and my brother, who was uh, 11 years older than I am, uh, bought the farm in Santa Quinn, just a small piece of ground in Santa Quinn. And we started farming there and, and have continued that. And now, uh, between my brother and myself, we we do have a lot of fruit uh, orchards in production now. I have eight sons, as he announced uh, earlier. Seven of them are living, and so seven of them participate with us on the farm. Six, however, are, are uh, farming at least half time. Uh, one does not, he's, uh, he's working in the educational field, and, and uh, a second one, which is here today, and I'm going to have him stand up, is, is actually working here at Snow and enjoys that very much. And so if any of you want to go into the engineering field, he can probably help you with that field. So Kyle, would you stand up? <laughs> Kyle is the, our eighth son, so he's the, the end of the string, so to speak. And uh, some of the others have been in the business for quite a few years with, with me as we started the business and have worked in the fruit growing area for some time now. I'd like to introduce my wife because be behind every, every man stands a good woman. And I, I really think that that's, that's true in, in my case. So I'd like to have Shirley stand up, if she will. I know she raised her hand, but I think it's, it's, not, it's not enough to just see the back of her hand. You need to see her beautiful face so that you can understand the, the power and motivation that, that she has had in my life, which I deeply appreciate. Well, we grow on our farm. We are in the food business, as I said. But our biggest crop is tart cherries. And we grow lots and lots of tart cherries, and we belong to a co-op that is, uh, processes our fruit. So we are tart cherry growers. We also grow apples, uh, several different varieties of apples, several different varieties of peaches. We, um, thanks to Kyle this year, have uh, started growing cantaloupe and watermelon. Uh, and he has primarily done that on his own. And we, we appreciate that. And then when it comes September and October, we begin the fall season. And that is uh, where we have school tours and people come to pick their own pumpkins. And it's kind of an agra agratainment, they call that. And I'll explain that a little bit later. But that's who we, we are. We're, we're fruit growers and have always been in the fruit growing business since uh, my grandfather came back uh, and settled in, in the Provo area. Uh, he, he came back actually from Mexico and he was, he, he was uh, born down in Mexico, in, in uh, Pacheco, Mexico. And so when he came back, they went to the Provo area and finally moved to the Orem bench. They called it the Provo bench. They called it at that time and that became Orem. And so our fruit farm was there to begin with. Now, in 1984, as I said, we started farming uh, just my family, just me and my sons and my wife. And so I'd like to tell you how what we all have now with our 
with our fruit growing operation, with the, as as was explained to you, we do these fall programs. We have the red barn where we make all kinds of ice cream and jams and syrups and and how did that all come about is what I'd like to tell you now. And so that tells you a little bit about who we are. And in 1984, we we had a. Uh, I would say a much smaller operation than we have now. But we were growing primarily cherries and just a very, very few apples. And the thing about tart cherries that you have to know is that Utah is the number two uh, producing tart cherry state in the United States. And I'll bet you didn't know that, that we grow uh, second only to Michigan, we are second only to Michigan in the tart cherry industry. And Michigan, however, is the dog and we are the tail. So even though we're number two uh, state in growing tart cherries, they grow somewhere around 200 million pounds. This past summer, Utah produced 40, which is, which is a lot. If you consider uh, 40 million pounds of cherries, that's a lot of trees and a lot of cherries, a lot of harvesting and a lot of everything. So we are still, however, number two. And the, the number three, probably I would say, is now Washington State, where another family of Rollies moved to Washington and started growing cherries, and now in that area, Washington is now probably the number three growing state in the United States. After that, it's Wisconsin, New York, Pennsylvania, and some of the other states. And what, what happens is the, why Michigan grows so many cherries is because they live around Lake Michigan. And Lake Michigan has a, a more temperate climate because, climate because of the water. The water makes the the ground not uh, quite so cold and the, and the spring frosts are tempered just a little bit so they grow a lot of cherries. They grow a lot of apples, a lot of other things too. Michigan is an agricultural state. I don't really know whether I would consider Utah as, as much of an agricultural state as some of the other states like Michigan and California and Ohio and some of the Midwestern states. So. In Utah, however, we started growing cherries back about 1910, uh, and it wasn't we because I wasn't even thought of by that time, but that's when the cherries began to uh, be grown in Utah, and they were primarily planted around the Provo Orem area, and so we started growing cherries then, and, and uh, we used to handpick our cherries. I can remember um, as we, we had small orchards and ladders and pickers that would come, I can remember hand-picking those cherries <clears throat> and it seems like tart cherries are a little bit different than sweet cherries and some of you maybe don't know the difference, but sweet cherries are what you buy in the store and they're those great big beautiful red cherries and you put them in your mouth and you you know, you just eat that nice cherry and then you spit the pit out. That's, that's a sweet cherry. Tart cherries are grown for uh, pie filling. And one thing that we do that I will tell you about in a few minutes, uh, what we do is we dry. All of, our, all of the cherries that are produced in Utah are dried. And so we'll talk about that in just a few minutes. But the tart cherry itself, I can remember when we used to hand pick them, I said to myself, I will never, ever grow tart cherries. Because you just hand picked them and, and put them in logs and took them to the processing plant and it was a dirty job. Your arms would get all black. And, and I thought, I, there's got to be easier ways to, to make a living than to grow tart cherries. But about the time I uh, left to serve a mission for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Some man in uh, Friday, back in Michigan, invented a machine that would pick <coughs> our chairs. And so, 
When I came back from a serving mission, we owned the machine. And after that, I thought that was the greatest machine in the whole world. Because then, you could pick a tree in about seven or ten minutes because you shook each individual limb on that tree. Nowadays, we pick cherries by shaking the butt of the tree. And you can pick a cherry tree in about 45 seconds. That's from tree to tree. If you really want to push it hard, you can pick them in about every 30 seconds. I think, I think Kyle can drive a machine about that fast. And I would, what I would like to do is to show you a little video of that right now to give, give you a feel for how we harvest our cherry crop. So I've got that, and I'll just uh, boot that up if I can, just a minute. cherry harvest. That kind of gives you an idea of what we do. This is an aerial shot uh, coming down on a harvesting machine in the orchard. You can see there, right there in the middle, of the machine is a, it's a two-sided machine, one on each side of the tree. You can see it's moving ahead a little bit. There they are again. This was a little tricky Photographing this, I had to be on a big tall ladder. That's not really true. <laughs> <laughs> now you'll see it drive up to that tree. And if you're timing and if you're looking at your watch, you can probably time that a little bit. But this gives you an idea of what the machine does. It goes out to the tree. They're being kind of careful. They don't want to hit the cameraman. Okay, now he's going to shake that tree just like that. Isn't that interesting? I just love it. I'm never tired of watching those cherries being picked off the tree like this because I remember handpicking them. <laughs> so you can see that's, a, that's one of our orchards. Um, and that you can kind of see the cherries going in. And what they do is they pick on that machine and they go into a big bit of water. They flow right into water, and you, you, you'll see that. There's, there's how they come off the tree, just like that. It's a little hot and sticky right then, and there's insects flying everywhere. And sometimes you shake a raccoon out of the tree, especially at night. Um, but you can kind of see that that's, uh, that makes it possible to pick cherries again. So I fell in love with growing cherries again. There, it's going into the tank of water. We're, we're showing how we uh, change the tanks on the machine there. That little thing that raised up on, on the tank prevents any spillage so that you don't lose any cherries as you go to the, the uh, the pad we call it, and where we accumulate the cherries. That's, that shows the, the truck being loaded uh, with those water bins. It's taking them over and you'll see where it's going to take them. It's just, we're just loading that truck up right now. Now, it's coming to our processing facility. We are a member of a processing co-op. <coughs> That co-op uh, has eight family farms, of which our family is one of them. <coughs> and you can see them unloading the cherries um, and then driving away with an empty tank. When they come to that processing facility, we take them inside, we pit them, we, well, we cool them first in super uh, icy, icy cold water. We take them and pit them. We put them in buckets so that we can dump them onto the dryer a little bit later. And that truck is on its way back to get its next load. By the time it gets home to the 
place where it was they were loading it, then it will be ready to uh, load up with another load. So that's how fast we can pick cherries. And if you're going to pick 40 million cherries in a year, you've got to have trucks so fast going all the time that you know they just it's we pick around the clock except for in the afternoon. In the afternoon <coughs> it's so hot that we don't like the cherries to get soft when we pick them. So we pick we pick all all uh, from evening clear through the night and clear through the day until about one or two o'clock in the afternoon then we stop. The processing facility uh, runs 20 hours a day and they take four hours to clean up each day. <clears throat> okay, that kind of gives you an idea. It's kind of fun to see us flying over that. You wonder how we did that? We did it with a drone. Okay, so that's the end. There was one other quick, uh, I'll, I'll just hurry with this video, but it shows how we plant the trees these days. In the old days, we used to dig the holes with a shovel. Uh, when we first started growing cherries in Santa Quinn, we would mark off the rows with a piece of twine that had a knot in it, and then you'd go down and wherever that knot was, you dig a hole with, it, with your shovel and put the tree in. Now, you're planting the tree every, oh, every time you pass through that line, you'll put a tree in. And so you can plant thousands of trees in two or three days. It shows you there, getting the bundle of trees, he puts the bundle on what we call a tree planter, which is, a, which is like a plow, it opens up the earth, and uh, you can see right there the planter going down that. He, he follows that. It takes a highly intelligent person to drive that tractor because he has to put that uh, wheel right in that rut. So I usually get that job because you can fall asleep and it just almost plants itself. But that shows you how, um, how we plant those trees. And I guess, I guess it, it explains to us a little bit about how agriculture has changed. We used to plant 100 trees or 200 trees a day when we'd dig those holes. We'd be really tired and go home and be glad that we planted that many. He's got more than that on the back of that tractor right now and he'll, he'll do those in just a, a few minutes and then he'll uh, load up again and go down another road. After we plant them, then we prune all the limbs off, and they look just like a stick. People have <coughs> asked, why do you do that? They look just like sticks in the ground. And we will come by with a water wagon and give them a little bit of water, and then follow up and give them a little bit of water and, uh, a couple of days later. And they do look like sticks, but what happens to that tree when you prune all those limbs off, then it says to itself, oh, I better grow. And so it's puts it into a mode of really growing. And they'll grow a limb, several limbs about that long. And then, just to surprise you, next year, the following spring, we go and prune all of those off. And we leave just a tiny little bit of a limb from the, from the tree, a limb that we're cutting off, we leave a little stub. And I'll tell you what that stub does. to a little stub and below that stub is a little bud and it puts the limb out and because you stubbed it off it makes the limb bend out more horizontally so those trees grow a little more horizontally and it makes the limb stronger in the tree so that they can withstand shaking the tree with harvesting equipment 
So that's what we do. So people have called us crazy. They say, why did you cut them that was growing so well and you cut them all off again? Well, that's the reason. Well, uh, so we grow all cherries. We grow some apples, some varieties of apples, and we've also started a juice processing business as well. But first I want to tell you the story about how Utah decided to be a dry cherry state. Why we dry cherries? We used to dry out or pack all of our cherries in 30 pound buckets with a little bit of sugar on top and you would put them in the freezer. We, we own several freezers and you'd put them in the freezer and sell them to pie making companies that would either make pie out of them and I'll bet if I had everyone raise their hand on when you ate your last cherry pie, I, but when do you ever do that? How many have had a cherry pie in the last month? Thank you. <laughs> we only expect a pie a month. It's <laughs> another one, you guys. Well, it tells you what's happened to this dessert field. I mean, if I would have seen all of you raise your hand, I would say, let's go back and and get back in the pie filling business. But you didn't. Well, you maybe had cheesecake. Maybe I should have included cheesecake. But the fact of the matter is, cherries in the dessert world have been declining. So it was about 1979, I think, somewhere along in there, that we had a visit from Utah State University. And the people that came from Utah State said, we've got this great idea. We've taken some tart cherries and we put it in our oven in the, in the food science department at Utah State. We put them in our oven and we dried these cherries. And when they came out, they were beautiful. And then we rolled them in powdered sugar. And we call them snow cherries, which I think would be a good thing to do here. At least you've got the name. <laughs> but anyway, so they, so they did that and they, they showed it to us and they said, you ought to try doing this. Well, at that point, there were very little dried cherries in the United States. There was one person doing it back in Michigan and that person was having a terrible time because he couldn't get them evenly dried. But Utah State made a pretty good point. So. The board of directors from Pace and Fruit Growers, which is our co where we process our, our cherries, decided to fly back and see what all this drying cherry business was all about. So we did. We flew back there, and I was just a young guy, younger, I won't say I'm not as young, but I was younger. We flew back there and looked at the process that was going on to dry those cherries. And what happened was, he was struggling because in every batch there was some moldy ones and there was some wet ones and there was some dry ones. But he was getting it down a little bit better. But sometimes people see you coming, you know, they, they see you coming and he had an extra oven and we bought it. That's what I say, people see you coming, we bought it and brought it home. And we put it in our plant and lo and behold, we had the same problems he did. So after we struggled for about a year and a half trying to grow cherries, the board of directors finally said, we have had enough, we've spent enough, that's a stupid idea, we will never do it again, let's quit. So we did. We took out all the equipment and we parked it in the back behind the building and there it sat. Well, about that same time, the cherry industry took a nosedive on prices. We were getting about all oh, seven cents a pound and it cost you four cents at that time to kind of pick them so you were you were just struggling with the tart cherry business and people were talking about well, let's pull these things out let's start planting apples and let's start planting peaches and plums and other things besides tart cherries they're never going to make any money and that particular year <clears throat> i remember we were dumping the cherries out of the freezer we were taking them to the landfill and dumping them because we were just eating up the profits and storage it costs to store them and to freeze them. So we were eating those up, we were dumping them. So we, we began to dump them. And I 
had this idea. I thought, I wonder whatever, why, is there any chance that we could try them again? So I went to the board of directors at Pace and Fruit Growers again, and I said, how about, I was one of the members of the board, I said, how about we try trying cherries again? Oh my goodness. <clears throat> They about ran me out of the room. But didn't we learn our lesson before? Well, I kept thinking about this. <clears throat> and I said to myself, there's got to be someone in the world that knows how to dry tart cherries. Tart cherries are mostly water. You know, they're not like some of the other fruits that are dry. They're, they're full of water. They're wet. So anyway, I decided there's got to be a place where they know how to dry fruit. So where do you think that would be? California. That's where they know how to dry fruit. So I called uh, University of California at Davis, and I asked them if they had a person there, and, and they put me in touch with a man named John uh, Thompson. And he was sort of their dehydrating expert in California. So I, I said to myself, well, let's, let's go down visiting. But at that point, um, no one wanted to do that from the board, of course. So I said to my wife, let's drive to California. We've loaded up all of our sons. Um, I'm not sure you were old enough to go, Kyle. Were you? You weren't even born. We loaded up all the sons. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you were the first spirit. Anyway, we went down there and, and we spent a few days with this, uh, it was Jim, excuse me, Jim Thompson. And we spent a few days with him. And by the time we got done with him, he said, you can dry tart cherries. We sat down and he taught me how to do dried cherries. We came up with a prototype of a machine that I could come home and build, and I did it. I came home and I built that. And the key was to put the right product with the, with the right amount of air and the right amount of heat. And if you had that, the flow, the heat, the air, then you would come up with a good product. So I, so I built this little prototype of a dryer. And lo and behold, we loaded it up with, with tart cherries, and they were wonderful. They were a little flat because they sat on trays, and I built trays, and and they were they were a little flat. So I thought, well, how are we going to get rid of that flatness? We've got to do something different. And this is this is the role of an entrepreneur. I don't know that I'm an entrepreneur, but if I was, then this is the role. It's the find out how you can do it better. One night, <clears throat> I was thinking about it, and I just, I don't know whether it was in the middle of the night or whatever it was, I thought to myself, there's got to be a way to make those cherries go through a drying facility, a drying machine, to where they don't just sit and get flat. Well, down the street was a <clears throat> a, a fellow that was a welder, and so I went to him and I said, do you know, how? can you help me build this, this dried cherry uh, dryer? And he said, he, he said, well, I could help you build one, but he said, I know just exactly what you described, and there's already something like that. There happened to be a grower, a cherry grower, that had an IQF, an instant quick freeze machine. And he had used that to to freeze his cherries, so I called him up. No, I sold that. He sold it a couple of years before. So I traced it down, and guess where I found it? In Oregon. I found it in Oregon. It was drying raspberries. Well, I called that man, and he said, I've just taken it out of my shed. I'm, I'm going to build a bigger one. It's sitting out back. So I loaded the family in the car, and we drove up there to see the, that dryer. And we ended up buying it, remodeling it, and turning it into a cherry dryer. About that time, <clears throat> as, I, as I started to dry those cherries, I would take a little few of them to the board meeting. Guess what? They were looking at those and saying, hey, those aren't so bad. How do we get in on this? <laughs> well, I wasn't quite as crazy as they thought I was, after all. And <clears throat> lo and behold, they took off and they they really sold well, and, and that's why now uh, we 
sold our little dryer that we got from Oregon back to Basin Fruit Growers, and now we have seven of them that are just like that, only twice, three times as big. So when you go past Basin Fruit Growers, that's what we do is we dry cherries all year long. We turn those cherries into um, all kinds of ingredients for breads, for salads, for uh, they go to power bars, we slice them, we dice them, we do all kinds of things with those, with that little cherry now. And because profitability returned to the tart cherry business, then all of those family farms and others have started growing tart cherries. And that's why Utah is now the second largest tart cherry growing state because we now have something that we do with those cherries be besides waiting for you to put them in your cherry pie, which none of you are doing. <laughs> so that's, that's how the cherry, the dry cherry business started, and that's how it's flourished, and that's, that's how we plant trees, and that's how we grow trees. And now I'm going to tell you a little bit about the other business that we started. Because when you grow fruit, <clears throat> Some of you probably like to go to Las Vegas. We don't have to go to Las Vegas. We gamble every spring because the fruit frost cold sometimes leaves us with no crop. And so even if you're the best man, even if you do everything right and you spray and fertilize and water and walk through the orchards and talk to the trees like I do, then you can do everything right and you can stand there in April, which is a terrible month for us, April and May. I know you, all of you love that because it's springtime, but that's a terrible month because you get those cold storms come in. And even last year, we stood in our orchard with the temperatures about 26 degrees and looked at each other and said, we probably won't have a crop this year. Even last spring, that's, this was last spring. And so there are times when you come up empty. We did have a crop this year. It was a great crop, but it was a crop. And we're, we were thankful for that. But sometimes you don't have that. And so I began to think there's got to be some things that we can do to at least help us through the years when we don't have a crop. And so that's when we decided that we would do something like the Red Barn. It didn't start out to be the Red Barn. What it started out to be is my wife making jam, cherry jam. Because I thought, well, I don't see cherry jam in the store. Maybe we can make cherry jam. And the misconception that you think is if I make a jar, I room and the whole world will want one. And that's not true. There's lots of things you have to do in order to promote that and, and to get it out there in the world. But we decided we would start to make that, so we did. We started to make jam, and, and um, about that time we, we uh, were also going through the dried cherry uh, development, and I thought to myself, well, I I think chocolate cherries are a good thing, so we decided we would cover the cherries with chocolate and yogurt. So we still do that. We still do that a lot even to this day. We, we cover the cherries with yogurt and we, we do all kinds of things with those cherries. And that's done just on our farm. It's not done in the co-op, it's just done on our farm. We dry the cherries, but then we bring them over and, and coat them with chocolate and yogurt and other good things. But the red barn was that was our way of mitigating the cold spring uh, because if we can come up with a, at least a business that will keep us alive in the fruit growing industry, you can die. Uh, two or three losses of your crop and, and you're gone. You're, you've decided you need to do something else and maybe you, you go drive a truck or something. But so that's, that's where we started. I thought we needed a place to showcase our products that my wife was busy making. She was the instigator of the, of the products and, and she would make them in our kitchen and, and 
try them out and we would see if they were pretty good and we we try them out on the neighbors at Christmas. Uh, <laughs> it's a good way to get rid of some of your experimental projects. We try them out on the neighbors, but, but they liked it, so we kept doing that. I thought we needed a place to showcase this. And so we, we had a little red building by next door to our house, and I thought, if we build it, they will come. I bet you've heard that before. So, so we remodeled this little shed, and we put a sign up on the highway that says, come down our lane and buy our products. Do you think they did? No, not that much. So we built it up by the freeway, and the rest is history. We have so many products that we make there now that I think we're going to have to expand as we go along. Um, <clears throat> we've also branched out into making apple juice, and now we sell apple juice uh, all through the state of Utah and some places in Idaho, and that's been a, a very good thing for us as well. I was going to say this part of our, our uh, time of the year, we do a lot of school tours, we welcome people to the, to the, um, to our, to our barn, so that they can uh, come and enjoy that. And I'd like to show you just a little bit while my wife and Kyle passes out this little card, which means that if you come to our barn and buy 10 ice cream, you can get one free. And then we, that's a big deal, isn't it? Why don't you just give us one free, right? Okay, we only have 10 minutes, so let's do those 10 minutes. Okay, while I talk. If you want, pass these out. And then you can pass out the treats. We've also brought some, just a little sample of treats. But I want to show you something that we do do. show you a little bit about, in fact today we're putting this presentation on to the, the school children. This just tells you a little bit about what we try to do to, to uh, have people come to our, our, uh, our barn. So we put on this little presentation for the children. It's, not, it's so simple and and uh, remedial that you probably won't. I'll just skip through and show you. By the way, this corner, this uh, left-hand corner, is a picture of my dad when he was uh, grading apples way back in 19, probably 20. It just shows you how we try to teach uh, the kids about our farm. A year on the farm, what we do. It shows you how we how we plant the trees. We teach them about blossoms. We teach them about all the things that we grow. We try to tell them about, it's just a, a presentation. And the, the idea isn't for you to, to look at this, but the idea is to learn about how we bring our information to the public. Anyway, a year of the farm starts with the blossom, and then it goes through till the harvest time. And, whoop, there is sound of this. That's good. Anyway, I just wanted to show you that. I would like to spend uh, about five, four or five minutes if you have questions about anything that we do. I, I, would, I will say this, uh, to be an entrepreneur is a wonderful thing. But don't make some of the mistakes that we make. If you build it, they won't necessarily come. You have to be you have to have a plan. You have to know how to work spreadsheets. You have to know how to uh, budget. I see lots of businesses that start up and they die. 
And the reason they die is because they didn't have enough longevity uh, financially to stay in business. And so some way, if you're going to be an entrepreneur, you have to find the backing and have the resolve to do just like Walt Disney did. It took him years and years and years until finally he came along with Snow White and the rest is history. But you have to come up with those ways to be productive. I appreciate the opportunity of being here and sharing our farm with you. I'd like to answer any questions that you may have. If some of you may have a question or two, then go ahead and raise your hand and ask. Yes, sir. Uh, that year that you had that harvest, um, we've had several of those. When, when that happens, do you have to import and cherry to keep your hands in the market? Yes, we do. And uh, on, a co on, a, on a co op basis, we have to bring cherries from Michigan or Wisconsin or Washington so that we can maintain our markets. That's tr That's correct. Was that your que the, the question was, I'm supposed to repeat the question. I remember now. <laughs> yeah, on, a, on a poor year, you have to bring in fruit from other areas to to maintain your markets. Okay, any other question? Did I see another one? Yes. Um, you said you've lost a number of different cherry fruit-based products. What's your most successful right now? Uh, I would say the dried cherry. Uh, if you're if you're talking, you mean just cherries? Um, no, I mean you talk about apple juice. And the the question was from our standpoint on our farm, which is the most successful product? Well, we grow so many more cherries than anything else we do that uh, that has to be the most successful product. But we do do a lot of uh, apple juice. Uh, you know, we we press a lot of apples and. And it goes throughout all the associated stores and Smith stores, so that that's getting bigger all the time. And then the barns themselves, the, the one in Santa Clara, the one in Washington area, they do well as well. Any other, another question? Yes. How do you expand? Like land seems like it's getting more expensive. Do you expand your orchard much? Well, you do. You have to find. You, first of all, you have to find an area that you think you can grow fruit. And then you expand. Uh, we've expanded in. Oh, how do you expand is the question. She, she's reminding me. I told her I wouldn't forget. How do you expand in the fruit growing business? That's, you have to find an area first because location, location, location is really important. Uh, we've expanded a little bit. Uh, my brother has expanded a little bit into Idaho. We've expanded in Utah a little bit. So you've got to find a way. But then you have to have money too. That's because land in Utah is expensive now. Another question? Yes. Have you found any ways to use the juice or other byproducts? Okay, the question was, have we found any ways to use the byproducts? From the cherry industry? Or? Okay, well, or the apples. Uh, there are several byproducts from the cherry industry, uh, and we use almost every one of them. The apple products, the black product is the pulp, and we've turned that into compost. So, but in the cherry industry, the pits, right now, um, we're doing a big experiment right now to utilize the oil in the pits, to grind that up and use that. It goes to facial soaps and facial creams and other things. And the, the juice that we, that we have, we concentrate that juice and sell that juice. We use it in a drying process. So we almost utilize every single bit of the cherry that we, that we have. Our growers return about 98, 97 to 98% of what they bring to our plant there. Okay, next question. Yes? Do you lose very many trees to disease? Okay, do we lose very many trees to disease? Yes, we do. And we lose a lot of trees to what we call shaker blight because shaking those trees is not a, a nice thing to do to the tree. We, our, our equipment is, is as good as they can make it right now and it's getting better, but it still shortens the life of that tree by quite a bit. So about 22 to 24 years, you're replanting your cherry trees. Apple trees and other trees, if you don't do that, they'll last 30, 40, 50 years. So, so yes, it does. It costs a little bit to be able to harvest those cherries like that. Another question? Am I out of time? Maybe one last question. One last question. Yes, sir. 
How long does it take to grow a mature tree? That's a good question. We grow cherry trees six years before we harvest anything. So if you're planning that, you need to have <coughs> resources to carry you through six years before you begin to harvest. And then, then you go from year six till about year 22 or 24, and then you replant. So thank you again for having us come. Stop at the Red Farm sometime, bring that card, and we'll give you an ice cream, and we appreciate that very much. Thank you. Innovating, be persistent when it looks like there might not be a way to make it work. The ideal will come fallacy and the law of the harvest might take a few years to leave a harvest. Thank you for attending and we'll see you next Wednesday.